Right, hi there folks, my name is Paddy Hogg. Um, I've studied for about 25 years the science of nutrition and I've kept a very close eye on um, the research to do with vitamin C and vitamin D for many a decade now and I have information that's come out of China and my own information from reading peer-reviewed science papers for quite a long time and I'm aware of the benefits of antiviral capacity of vitamin C in reasonably high doses and the importance of vitamin D3 and I'd like to take you through the science and some of the pointers that suggest that we can do things for ourselves in these unbelievable um, times where a virus is causing such panic as a pandemic throughout the Western world and Asia etc. And what I want to do is take you through a presentation as reasonably as quickly as possible and try and do a wee bit of empowerment. We're in a crisis situation, but there's things we can do ourselves for by what we're being told from on high, like washing your hands, etc. We can do things that benefit us and that will, to a fair extent, either prevent us getting the disease, the virus, or if we were to contract it, um, it would maybe not so much stop it in its tracks but it might lower the symptoms considerably if we were to catch it at all. First thing that should be said really is that if you look at the stats from the CDC in America influenza kills up to 50,000 people every year and there are lots of different coronaviruses one or two of them cause colds some of them cause influenza. Influenza kills a lot more people and we can see from what's happened in China, they have stopped it in its tracks. And we should be asking why. Well, here's some of the information straight from a Dr. Richard Chang. He's an American doctor who's flown across to help out in China. And a Dr. Andrew W. Saul. Andrew W. Saul runs ortho, orthomoleculormedicine.com on the internet. He's been an expert in vitamin C for a good 40 years or so. Um, and what we know that's come out of China is as follows. Dr. Chang has reported successes with IV vitamin C, where he's saying some of the patients who have had vitamin C have walked out of the ICUs who were critically ill. So it is curing them of COVID-19. There are three clinical trials on IV vitamin C, that's intravenous vitamin C, ongoing at the moment. I look forward to those results. Andrew W. Saul reports um, that 50 tonnes of vitamin C in tablet form, that's 106 million vitamin C tablets, were shipped by a company into Wuhan city and given out free. China produces 90% of the world's vitamin C, so that's pretty good for them at the moment since it's, it's, it seems to be working for them. And the government is recommending 2 grams of vitamin C every day to all of the citizens of the country. The doctors are packing their bags with vitamin C tablets. So let's ask a question rhetorically. What has helped stop the virus spreading in China? What's the best practice model coming out of China? Are we hearing any of this from our established media? Are we hearing this in the BBC News and ITV? Are we getting this in the newspapers? We heard about chloroquine um, chloroquine um, and its uses as the antiviral, sorry, the anti-malarial um, drug and good for President Trump tweeting about it as well. So it, it was active in vitro and I've heard of some patients being cured of COVID-19 where they were taking, I think it was 20 out of 20 patients and they were taking that along with another um, form of medicine but it had cured at least some of them. Is there time for big clinical trials for um, chloroquine, chloroquine, sorry, um, anti-malarial drug? We could all have access to vitamin C and I want to go on and show the veracity of vitamin C, the scientific veracity at least. It can boost your immune system, but the basics are there's different types of vitamin C, ascorbate acid, sodium ascorbate, liposomal vitamin C and intravenous vitamin C. So intravenous is via a drip. And we know there's three clinical trials going on there and some of the patients are already up 
and a way home and they're fine. So that's good news to hear. Ascorbic acid itself, you can buy this from anywhere, internet, Holland and Bar, wherever. Ascorbic acid is the more acidic of the two. Sodium ascorbate is more alkaline, so it's a bit easier on the stomach. Now, both of them are vitamin C, and vitamin C is water soluble, which means it goes through um, maybe 60% is bioavailable, is taken up through the stomach lining, and you, you will use about 60% of it. So, if you take two grams, you're only really getting roughly just over one and a half grams that's going to be utilized in your body. And the recommendations, the daily recommended amounts in the UK for vitamin C, are disgustingly and disgracefully low. I'll go on to make a point about that later and explain why. But if you can get your hands on ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate, the both vitamin C, you can take up to two grams per day. It does no harm. It cannot really do any harm. And basically what you can do is you can take it up to what they call bowel tolerance. So it'll make you go to the toilet. And what that is an indicator of is if you take something like, I've taken like 10 grams in a day, and if I've taken a teaspoonful of ascorbic acid, maybe two grams of it in one go, and went to the toilet, had to go to the toilet due to bowel tolerance, it means your body's saturated, so it's getting rid of the, the excess. If you're needing lots of ascorbic acid, whatever type you take, the vitamin C, and you take in 10 grams and you don't have to go to the toilet, there's no bloating or passing of wind, etc. It just means your body's using it all up, so you need it. And we tend to be, over the winter, we tend to be a bit low in this and vitamin D3 as well. There's also liposomal vitamin C that's more bioavailable, a bit more expensive, but it gets around the water-soluble issue with the small liposome. So if you imagine a cell of vitamin C, it is surrounded by the small liposomes and it carries it through the stomach lining. So you get about 99% of the vitamin C into your body and into your blood system. The IV vitamin C is not available in the NHS for whatever reasons, maybe a bit too cheap. Big Pharma can't make money from it, but it's been used in China just now. It's been used for other things as well, and I'll go on to mention that. The veracity of IV vitamin C goes right back to about 1936. It was used to cure polio. A Dr. Klenner cured, I think it was 40 or 40, his patients of polio and nasty virus. And there's been many other shocking diseases like Ebola, which was killed off using IV vitamin C, glutathione and ozone therapy. They tend not to let this information out because it seems to be that this cheap vitamin threatens big pharma's, you know, pharmaceutical products, that the drugs that they want to sell to us. Vitamin C is needed for the white blood cells. Two of the types of white blood cells that the immune system uses are neutrophils and lymphocytes. So they're immune, immune cells. There's about five, different, five or six different types of white blood cells, but these are the two key ones that vitamin C is needed, so it's absorbed by the neutrophils and the lymphocytes. Vitamin C, and this is really important when it comes to COVID-19, vitamin C is an immune modulation. Um, it, it, it's, it's got immune modulation properties, I should say, i.e. it produces interferon and that reduces viral infection and interferon stimulates the antibodies as well. By immune modulation properties, I'm saying it will stop a cytokine storm production, which is what's happening once people, if you imagine the chronology of this disease, when you get infected, you might have no symptoms, then it gets to the point where it's in your throat and it's down in the upper respiratory tract and it's getting into your lungs. That's when it can cause pneumonia, etc. And that pneumonia, and there can, there, there can be huge inflammation. Then when that inflammation gets out of hand, the immune response can be chaotic, which causes a cytokine storm, and that's what can cause the damage and kill people. So if vitamin C, not if, vitamin C has an immune modulation capacity, is the word I was looking for earlier, or sort of facility that it does, it will stop the cytokine storm. So we need to increase our uptake of vitamin C. If you so what I'm saying here is if you take it now with the possible chance you might get catch this virus, it will prevent the cytokine production. 
if you take it in the right amount. A couple of grams seems to be the right amount. Vitamin C is antiviral. Now, I've said, as I said earlier, it goes back to the 1930s. This is in the peer-reviewed literature. You can check it in PubMed. So vitamin C will help activate T helper cells by the thousands and bring a pathogen or virus to the natural killer cells, that's the NKCs, NKCs and the killer cells will act as a tab, tag team in killing the virus. Vitamin C inhibits viral re replication. The white blood cells have about 80 times the vitamin C payload of any other cell in the body in the cytoplasm. So what does that tell you? Vitamin C is essential for our immune system. It's an antioxidant. It reduces inflammation, so at the right levels it will stop a cytokine storm. So it is a, an immune, immune modulator. Vitamin C breaks down to hydrogen peroxide to kill pathogens, including some cancer cells. So hydrogen peroxide is basically the bullets of vitamin C that go into the white blood cells. So vitamin C, the mechanism of action is that it creates, breaks down to hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide can kill the, the virus. Vitamin C, again, this is extremely important, helps to increase oxygen uptake into the blood, so the blood count goes up. Most patients who get something like COVID-19 or influenza, their white blood cell count drops, their oxygen levels in the blood goes down, and they're unable to fight a virus as it takes over their system if their immune system is low. Vitamin C also as well, and this is a general mechanism of action, it donates an electron to disease cells to repair the cell. And basically we need a healthy gut microbiome and healthy kidney function to utilise vitamin C properly. So we need healthy food in our gut microbiome, that's like the, the GI tract. And we need lots of water for the, the kidney function to work. So if you take lots of vitamin C, you need lots of water. For those who want to check out the science, and you should all the time, we should all know this stuff, see PubMed, that's a database of peer-reviewed science. And the most recent one I could find is the antiviral properties of vitamin C, peer-reviewed, published 16th of December 2019. Vitamin C binds to transporter 2. This is the respiratory mechanism. So what we, ha what we have happening is if you've got plenty of vitamin C in your blood system, the vascular endothelium cells, they have got what's called a sodium vitamin C transporter 2 site. There's a transporter 1 elsewhere. Vitamin C travels through the vascular endothelium layer to the alveola type 1 epithelium. From there, the vitamin C binds to the next layer of the sodium vitamin C transporter 2 and then it's pushed into the alveola space. Hence, vitamin C in high dose, particularly intravenous, should be a treatment to target acute respiratory stress syndrome. That's what happens near the end stage when our system has been taken over by the COVID-19 virus. As I mentioned earlier, Ebola was killed off by intravenous vitamin C combined with glutathione and ozone therapy. So an even more lethal um, virus has been killed off using vitamin C in combination with other therapies. If a disease hits your body quickly, this is how vitamin C works very effectively, such as swine flu, a high dose is essential to hit it rapidly. So it's not really effective for chronic illnesses, but it's very effective in the right dose for something that hits quick, like sepsis or swine flu. One example, a New Zealand farmer, Alan Smith, you can find this on YouTube, he'd white out pneumonia, so he, was, he couldn't breathe. He, was, he had this iron lung, the ecto machine that was breathing for him, but the family contacted Dr. Thomas Levy. He suggested IV vitamin C, and the IV vitamin C cured the farmer's um, acute respiratory illnesses. And 
as a bonus it got rid of his leukemia as well that just mysteriously vanished he'd been diagnosed with that years before check out the veracity of the signs from looking at dr cathcart an amazing genius dr Klenner as well and you can find these guys on youtube they'd been using it long before from the 50s 60s 70s and 80s right through till the modern leading expert dr thomas levy A bit more of the science for those of you that are into checking this out. I won't go into it in detail, but this just shows you how the role of vitamin C in the function of um, vascular endothelium, and it shows you the mechanisms by how transporter one, the sodium dependent vitamin C transporter one and two, how the vitamin C can get into the blood through the cells and um, through the blood vessels and then to different organs and different tissues from the liver, muscle, brain pituitary and adrenal glands. So you can see the, there's a fair bit of science to this. Our immune system is very complex and you could do a day's lecture on this really, but conceptually it's usually described as innate and adaptive immune system. And you can see here that um, NKC, that's the natural killer cells, and the T cells, phagocytes, etc., they will eliminate enemies and form the B cells, so it's like a tag team, and the B cells produce the antibodies. But our responsive immune system tends to be slower than the innate. And what we're trying to do is um, beef up the ammunition to beef up our immune system by giving the vitamin C and vitamin D and other nutrients I'll just mention shortly. Quick comment on epigenetics and the microbiome, and really all I'm trying to say here is that what we take in our mouth, and if it's good quality food, it's not sugar, it's not processed foods, glyphosate, GMO, etc., other toxins, heavy metals, if we take in good healthy food, we are upgrading the gene expression of our entire system, so we're switching on more genes. If you take in all the bad food, processed foods, and the bad diet we have, particularly in Scotland, you're down-regulating gene expression. And I'll mention the effect just shortly. So you take on all the sort of bad habits of food, you're contributing towards autoimmune diseases. You're contributing towards leaky gut. Leaky gut means stuff is going to get into your brain, into the blood system, then to your brain that shouldn't. And another wee fact that's interesting is there's millions of bacterial genes in the microbiome compared to about... 20,500 human genes. So we need to look after our microbiome and it looks after us. So it's a simple sort of scientific and medical truth there. And here's the process and the schemata. We eat healthy, the genes get expressed and can be upregulated and that improves our immune system. So the healthier we eat, the better our immune system is going to be. Magnesium is responsible for around 300 enzymes. We're quite often deficient in magnesium. So it's the enzymes that are going to be in the microbiome that will influence the epigenetics, then the genes switching on look for the enzymes to then help in the, in, in the process. Vitamin D3, a secosteroidal hormone. It's popularly known as the sunshine vitamin. Vitamin D3 deficiency is in the general public in the northern hemisphere. We don't get enough sunlight. What happens is the sunlight hits your skin, it utilises uh, cholesterol and it creates what's known as hydroxy-25 blood serum. You can ask your doctor for a count for that, but they'll be too busy to do that just now. Or you could take it from me and the experts that hydroxy-25 blood serum is always low in winter. We're never told to take enough vitamin D. We need around 2,000 IUs per day in the winter, more if you have a virus. You can take it in spray form or capsule form. But one of the key things to remember with vitamin D3 is that vitamin K2 is required to transport calcium into the bones. It was thought five, 10 years ago that you take vitamin D, that improves calcium getting into your bones. Wrong. The science shows that if you take, and I've done this, if you take vitamin D3 in pills that you can get from Holland and Barrett with calcium, and you don't take the vitamin K2, that the D3 will have some effect, but the, the calcium stays in your blood and your blood pressure will go up. The systolic blood pressure will increase. So that's not a healthy thing. Too much calcium 
can cause high blood pressure and then other things come from that. So you need vitamin K2 to act like a porter and transport the calcium, click it into place in the bones. White blood cells all have vitamin D3 receptors. Vitamin D3 helps with the upper respiratory diseases. It also is an immune modulator with vitamin C. So we increase the, our intake of both vitamin C and vitamin D to a reasonably good level. You can go too high with vitamin D, but you're talking probably 100,000 IUs per day. So if anyone tells you 2,000 IUs isn't enough, tell them to go and have a look at Professor Michael Hollick, because there's so many people out there reading nonsense from the newspapers and stopping us living healthy lives by saying, oh, that's rubbish, you need a, a tin hat or whatever nonsense. Ask them to check the signs. If they're open-minded, hopefully they will. Right. The last point there says that you get the active um, vitamin D, D metabolite and it's used by the immune macrophages, dendritic cells, T and B cells, which hydroxylate vitamin D through two enzymes, the CYP27A1 and CYP27B1. So you can see here why we're talking about the microbiome and the upregulation of genes. So what you have is you need the metabolite to be at the right level so that the macrophages, dendritic cells and T and Bs can use it. If it's not high enough, it can't find them and you need the enzymes for the metabolic process to work. Here's one example here, um, gene expression with vitamin D3. So an example, the T cells locate a foreign pathogen or virus, then a vitamin D receptor allows the T cell to bind to what's called calcitriol, that's one form of vitamin D. Firstly though, the T cells express the gene CYP27B1, which converts vitamin D calcitriol into the D steroidal hormone calcitriol. After binding to calcitriol T cells, they kill the pathogen or virus, and the dendritic cells, macrophages, etc., need vitamin D hormone to express the same gene. To function. So if we are low in vitamin D, we're down-regulating the expression of that gene. So we can see the relevance of epigenetics, etc., and taking the right nutrients in. Just to show that this is this is solidly scientifically based, um, here's a, a couple of schematic illustrations that show vitamin D is a does modulation of the immune system, innate and responsive. So on the left it's like vitamin D receptors, they're all over the place, most organs have got vitamin D receptors, there's hundreds of thousands of them all over the body. On the right you can see the vitamin D relationship with dendritic cells, monocytes, macrophages and the T cells and the B cells. So it's an intrinsic part of our immune system is the utilisation of vitamin D. If our immune system is low in vitamin D, that's almost everyone in, in, in the UK over the winter, winter. So when someone's saying, oh, you've got a compromised immune system, most of us have got a compromised immune system over the winter because we don't have enough vitamin C or vitamin D3. And that is why flus and influ influences can hit people at this time of year. Uh, next screen here shows vitamin A some minerals and the micronutrients. If you want to look into the importance of these, look at the fantastic expert Dr. Rhonda Patrick on the role of micronutrients, epigenetics and microbiome. You'll find her on YouTube. She is fantastic. Now, vitamin A is important, particularly at this time, because the metabolites of vitamin A have an effect on the adaptive immune response, right? But vitamin A also is important because it helps the bones to create new white blood cells and the white blood cell count will go down if there's a virus affection attacking you and if it gets to something like 3,500 ml per litre what happens is you will start displaying the same symptoms as COVID-19. Um, usually headaches, temperature, coughing, the whole thing so the white blood cells and keeping the count up and vitamin A is quite important. Magnesium is important because most people are deficient in that too. It helps with electrolyte cell signaling and contraction of vascular bronchial tissue muscle. So if you're going to try and relax, if you're 
tight in your chest, magnesium is a good thing to take, particularly if you've got something like asthma. I know from being a kid, having asthma, that magnesium was helpful in relaxing um, tightness in the chest. Iodine is extremely important as well. So it can be very important for the thyroid glands. It's an antioxidant. It improves immunity. You can find it in droplet form or in kelp, but be careful not to take too much because it will speed up your metabolism. Zinc is extremely important. The word coming from China is that it's very important. Zinc. It helps increase antibodies and improve immune response and it's essential for enzyme work. Glutathione is the master antioxidant. The precursors, <coughs> excuse me, precursors to glutathione are different amino acids which are glutamate, glycine and cysteine. So if you're taking some of these amino acids your body will metabolically help create glutathione. So glutathione, one of the benefits of glutathione is that it helps to regenerate other antioxidants. So if you're taking vitamin E and you're getting low on that, glutathione's got a fantastic switching ability where it will improve. If vitamin E goes low, it helps to create more vitamin E and it will do the same with C. So glutathione is fantastic. Hence the link, intravenous vitamin C, glutathione, etc. with Ebola. Something that most people might not know is that one of the most powerful hormones to boost our immune system is melatonin. And sadly, if we don't know this and we don't sleep well, the melatonin goes down. So melatonin is, is anti-inflammatory as well. It's antioxidant. Um, it's got DNA and RNA repair capacities. We will lower our melatonin if we get too much blue light. We're watching too many screens, etc. Because that blue light lowers melatonin. That's known scientifically. Sleep deprivation lowers antibody production. White blood cells have all got a melatonin receptor. So we need our melatonin to be healthy. So we need to get to bed earlier, do a, you know, some good healthy sleeping and less stress, which I'll go into in a minute. Melatonin is created usually between midnight and 3 a.m. So good sleep is essential to create melatonin um, stimulated from the pituitary gland. We should flag up, because this, no doubt, the our governments won't flag this up. If you're on night shift, you generally suffer from lower melatonin and that lowers your immune system. And if your melatonin is low and you're a night shift worker, you're more prone to get certain cancers. So try and get more sleep. Or if you're a night shift worker, ask your doctor to see if you need melatonin tablets. Stress lowers the immune system. Stress can collapse your immune system. Cortisol release from the adrenal gland causes the immune system to be damaged. It increases blood pressure, it lowers bone density, it increases the blood sugar levels, fight flight, and it lowers our immune system. What we need to do is lower stress, and some of the best ways of lowering stress, a wee bit of Scottish comedy, put on your favourite comedian, find some healthy ways to lower stress, go for a walk, out into the woods, anything, walking up and down your steps, doing some press-ups, do exercise, anything that sort of helps, don't do it excessively, um, but dancing, laughter, fun, anything that boosts endorphins. If it boosts endorphins, it, it boosts your immune system. Check out something called LDN, low dose naltrexone, that's what it does. It, it ends up boosting the endorphins if you take that and it helps your immune system. We should take this opportunity when this crazy virus is causing so much mayhem to do a reset. And what I mean is, let's try and turn this into a positive and say to ourselves, we're going to change what we eat. We're going to improve our diet. We're going to eliminate environmental toxins and food toxins as much as we can. And what I mean here is glyphosate. It's in about 62% of brown breads. Glyphosate's a weed killer and it's produced by Monsanto. I've been trying to get some constructive stuff done around Cumbernauld in this and it's it's coming but not quite there yet. Glyphosate can cause leaky gut. It's in the food chain. Anything to do with wheat, barley, corn etc. You can get what you think is healthy porridge. If it's not um, gluten free you might have glyphosate in it. So look and check out glyphosate and try and avoid any foods with it. Go gluten free if you can. Particulate matter, that's from diesel fumes, busy city roads, 
pollution causes um, our immune system to, to become lower. Aspartame, diet sugars, they're worse than sugar. Sugar itself, in my view excessively, is a poison, it's toxic. Trans fats, mercury amalgams in tooth fillings, etc. These are worse if you've got Wi-Fi radiation because it works like an antenna. So this is the truth of the situation. Aluminium, monosodium glutamate, excessive calcium as mentioned earlier. So trying to improve the stuff that we eat. Quick summary, lower stress, get rid of the cortisol, try and relax. Stress flattens the immune system. Get better sleep, it increases melatonin. If you're night shift, try and speak to your doctor about this because it, it is a condition um, where you're more likely to get different diseases if you're not getting enough melatonin. Let food be thy medicine, healthy organic food that's glyphosate free. You know, cook food, throw out your microwave. And I'm not being silly there, microwaves destroy the good nutrients in food. I only found this out in the last six or seven months and I just, I've been cooking, always enjoyed cooking food anyway because it's a wonderful thing to do. Fresh fruit, kiwis, oranges, beetroot, broccoli, sprouts. Help your microbiome to help you. If you're juicing, remember this, the microbiome prefers the fibre, not the juice. So don't throw the fibre out. You're throwing out the best stuff. Antiviral vitamin C will get people through this crisis if we take it with vitamin D3. We need to take more than the recommended daily amounts. Someone should put a petition to Parliament to say, oh, wake up, get out of the 18th and 19th century. Vitamin C in higher doses, the science proves this. This is not opinion. Big Pharma has been pushing this truth aside because they can't make money out of vitamin C. And that is the truth. Vitamin C, two grams a day just now, will be preventative for this disease. If, it, if you end up catching it, if you've got two grams or three grams of vitamin C, it will debilitate and lower the effects of what it might do to you. And if you're high in vitamin D3, reasonably healthy amounts of vitamin D3, 2,000 I use per day. If you've got plenty of vitamin A, magnesium and zinc and iodine in your system, your immune system is going to be orchestrated and all in tune and it's going to work effectively. Lower the toxic load. Go gluten-free. Get rid of glyphosate out of your system, GMOs as well, and lower the sugar intake lower the sugar intake, have exercise, fun and laughter, dance and show love to people. Help your fellow man and women. This is a time for our communities to give well-being, to boost their endorphins. Let's boost our communities' endorphins by showing we're not wanting to be panic buyers. We want to help each other because it's part of our human, um, humanity that compassion is the key. Check out LDN, Low Dose Naltrexone Benefits. That deserves another full um, presentation. Take back control of your health. Don't listen for a First Minister or a Prime Minister to say you should take vitamin C, because this telly is nothing about this. And I think it's a disgrace. We need to heal ourselves, mind, body and soul. We need fun, we need happiness and love. And we need to help other people, because it's a good thing to do. So let's boost our endorphins and boost our immunity and boost our humanity by helping each other through this with particular respect to our Chinese brothers and sisters who seem to have stopped this and done a fantastic job. Now I've worked in policy development a few years back um, and I would suggest that given the expertise of the scientists that went before me, so I'm relying on theirs, this, this is not my opinions, what we need to do and learn from the effects of this virus is to make sure our immune systems are tuned up, particularly over the winter. So we need to empower people to take back their own health by taking vitamin C because it's cheap and D3 supplements during the winter period. We need a winter immune policy program for vitamin D3 and different supplements. Vitamin C is antiviral and it will protect the population from various viruses. Education of all our medical staff and vitamin health benefits and science about the essential micronutrients for the microbiome and immunity, especially the anti-inflammatory antioxidants. All of these things together might have meant hardly anyone would die in this country.
if this virus had hit. We tend to rely too much on vaccines. That's the panacea, that's, the, that's where big business, big pharma makes lots of money doing that. We tend to have, have had our power taken away from us and we just do what we're told. The recommended daily amounts are a joke. The science is telling us that. It's time to wake up people and it's time to wake up to the reality that the science is showing in China just now the truth that's been known since the 1930s that vitamin C is antiviral at the right amount. So we need to get rid of the old bad biases and attitudes that have been stymieing the truth of the science and look at the veracity of using vitamin C as an NHS emergency protocol. So we need policy changes so it's natural for us not to be attacked on Facebook when we say vitamin C high doses will help us through this. Because people are, through their own ignorance and through dumbing down and through picking nonsense out of newspapers, trying to suppress this. And we've now got, since event 201, check part 4, where they said they would shut down and close down all misinformation. And they mentioned vitamin C as one of the things they would shut down. They are actually shutting down science and I will say this as forcefully as I can. Those who shut down science and the veracity of IV vitamin C from Event 201 and Facebook and YouTube doing this just now are the ones helping to kill people. This can be used as a cure and a preventative. If you catch the disease and you start taking this, it will slow down the symptoms. It might even stop it and it might help you get through that if we take vitamin C in the right dose, we will get through. And if we change policy so that people are advised at the start of winter from end of September to take two grams of vitamin C, just as the entire Chinese population have been asked to do, two grams of vitamin C and enough vitamin D, the amount of influenza, colds and other viruses that affect people will go down and we will collectively be healthier. No doubt they will roll out some people to attack this, but they're usually paid hacks by Big Pharma. What I've tried to show you in this presentation is basically the truth of the science and the veracity of taking vitamin C. It will do no harm. So get the stuff into your body, go safe, and let's pull together. Or one family, we're all brothers and sisters under the skin. One family, let's pull together and all the best folks.